Hello, this is Christopher Long, and you're listening to The Digital Dialogue, a podcast dedicated to cultivating the excellences of dialogue in a digital age. This is episode 70, and today I'm joined by Richard Lee, Jr., professor of philosophy at DePaul University. Rick has published extensively on medieval uh, and early modern philosophy, the Frankfurt School, and social and political philosophy. He has published two books, The Force of Reason and the Logic of Force by Paul Grave in 2004, and Science, the Singular, and the Question of Theology, which is also Paul Grave in 2002. And he's also published uh, essays in journals such as Telos, Hobbes, Stu Studies, Vivarium, and the Graduate Faculty Philosophy Journal. His forthcoming book is entitled Thinking of Matter. Rick has been on the digital dialogue before, and I uh, invite you to listen to episode 30 on the logic of force, where we discussed his work on Hobbes' materialism. There, I think you'll hear some of the inchoate ideas fleshed out further in the forthcoming book. What brings him to the digital dialogue today is, in fact, precisely what brought us together as friends more than 20 years ago the teaching and work of Richard J. Bernstein. This weekend, a group of his students came together to celebrate his life and work in a conference called Thinking the Plural, organized by Eduardo Mendieta, chair of the philosophy department at Stony Brook, and Marsha Morgan, uh, assistant professor of philosophy at Muhlenberg College. The papers delivered this weekend will be published in a fest trip for Bernstein entitled Thinking the Plural, Richard J. Bernstein's Con Contributions to American Philosophy, co-edited co-edited by Marsha Morgan and Jonathan Pickle. So welcome, Rick, to the Digital Dialogue. It's great to be back. So I think the way, great way to begin might be to just talk a little bit about when we first met in that uh, Wittgenstein Tractatus course uh, um, so many years ago. I guess that must have been in, two, in 1992, maybe the fall? It, it could be. Your memory's probably better than mine. It was well, a long time ago. Right, I just know when we when I, when I started at, at the New School in 1991, but I don't think I took that class until my second year, so I was a little uh, intimidated by taking a Bernstein class. I needed a year under my belt. <laughs> oh, so you did that year by taking Shermont classes? <laughs> no, actually, uh, that was even more intimidating. I just pulled the Band-Aid off that fall uh, of 2000, uh, 1992 and took, took Bernstein and Shermont at the same time, which actually you and I were talking about this this weekend as a, as a kind of good combination of, of two faculty members with very different approaches but all but two professors who were just tremendously uh, important to both of us. Yeah, I mean they each in their own way had a tremendous impact on me. I mean Schurman was not someone that you would initially think of as a sort of democratic teacher. I mean he lectured um, constantly even in seminars but I mean, I learned a lot from that, and and I've taken some of his style. Bernstein was um, always a lot more inviting and open, and we were sort of we got the sense that we're struggling together with the ideas and the texts. Um, also productive, but in a dramatically different way. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think the way um, I mean, I wouldn't characterize Sherman's pedagogy as inviting us into. Uh, into the text. I mean, he his invitation to the text was to perform a kind of reading, and you and you learned by just kind of being uh, in the presence of that and and being transformed by it. But with Bernstein, we really were invited to sort of take up the text in a specific kind of way and uh, engage with with it not only as a as a uh, work of writing, but also engage with the spirit of it. Yeah, I think that's right. I think I learned from Schurman the the sort of the seriousness and the amount of work it takes to engage with uh, the material. And with Bernstein, I learned a lot about um, the sort of um, practice. I mean, he sort of performed that struggle for us in public, whereas Schurman presented the fruits of that labor. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a good way of putting it. So, I mean, I think I just remember that first... Uh, first class, actually we were talking about this this weekend, that first class on uh, the Wittgenstein class, Bernstein asked you to, to give the first presentation, and I said, oh, okay, this, this guy, Rick Lee, has got to be a serious person if Bernstein's asking him to give the first presentation. Yeah, I think he always had a, a kind of respect for um, 
people who did medieval philosophy because he thought like if you can do that and if you could make it uh, as he put it this weekend if you could make that interesting then you must really have some skill yeah I think that one of the things that's that's uh, great about Bernstein is that you know the range of his uh, of his interests but uh, we can we probably should get into that with regard to the the kind of range of papers that we heard this weekend but but before we do that, I, I just want to talk a little bit more about, you know, the, the concrete terms of his pedagogical uh, practice because he really, um, he had a way of, of drawing you into the, into the text and into a, an engagement with it that was, uh, on the one hand, perplexing. I mean, it brought you into the, the perplexity of it, but it also, it, it never left you, you know, swimming helplessly with, without any hope of uh, clarification. <laughs> Yeah, that's true, and I, I think, I mean, part of it was that um, he would allow you the freedom to to uh, struggle um, and sort of uh, help you clarify your your own struggle with difficult material. I mean, we were in a, te a class on the Tractatus, which is not the easiest material to work through, um, but he also did that, and we talked a bit about that this weekend. Um, he he also helped you with your struggle by sort of seriously um, engaging you, and I mean he was not always so gentle, but somehow you always felt safe, like he was challenging you because this material mattered and we should get some clarity on it. Yeah, one of the things that he said in his uh, closing lecture that uh, is related to this and was poignant for me was, you know the the endeavor to see the argument or the position of, an, of another in the best possible light. So you always had, however critical he was, and he, he was critical, I mean, there's no doubt about it that he was saying hard, um, critical things to, to people, but it was, it was never um, with the intention of knocking you down or knocking uh, even the argument down in a way. It was really more in this kind of spirit of making it better. You can make it better. This is not quite convincing. This is... This needs to be fleshed out further. You're, there's slippage over, you know, between these concepts. Those are the kinds of things that he would he would uh, prompt you with. Yeah, I think that's right. And I mean, he I got from him because of that um, a, a tremendous respect for clarity. And I also saw the difficulty in being clear. I mean, to be to write and speak and think clearly requires a tremendous amount of understanding but I think it comes from that kind of openness um, to you know putting the other or the text in the best possible light I think that's what allows him to speak so clearly I, I think by the way not to get too political but I think that's why some people in the so-called continental world don't take him as seriously as I think they should because of the clarity and the and the, his his attempt to articulate things not only clearly but al also in in um, in terms that are accessible. Yeah, and I think there's a a contingent of our colleagues who think that if it's clear, it must not be deep. <laughs> right, in the good Adornoian tradition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you know he. I mean, there again too, you had a you had a kind of contrast with 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 Reiner Sherman. Um, uh, although Sherman too was clear, uh, I mean, but of course he had a, a vocabulary that you had to learn and find your way into. Uh, right. Whereas I think Bernstein was much more uh, willing to try to take up the language of the thinker with whom you were, we were reading or we were engaged, and 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 try to take that vocabulary on and, and try to make sense of that. Yeah, I agree. So, I mean, one of the themes of the uh, weekend was pluralism. The whole uh, conference was called Thinking the Plural. And, um, you know, we really had a tremendous uh, um, uh, group of uh, presenters giving papers on uh, everything from uh, Sellers to uh, John William Miller, uh, Katie Tsaratakis did that at the end, to Husserl, to Dun Scotus, your paper on Dun Scotus, to Hegel. Karen Eng gave a paper on Hegel. So we we had uh, um, just not to interrupt, but all the way to the 21st century with your paper on 
ethics in a dig digital age. Yeah, that's right. And 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 drawing they're drawing really strongly on um, American pragmatism, which actually surprised Bernstein a little bit because I uh, I sat in on his uh, pragmatism class after I was done with coursework and. And uh, that was my first introduction to pragmatism, but I never took pragmatism with him per se. So I think he was a little surprised to see so much purse in my paper. I had a course with him on pragmatism that in which we read Habermas and Gadamer. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I think for a while there in the early uh, 90s, he was, he was really doing that, that new wave of, of pragmatism. Yeah. Yeah, that was capturing his sole attention then. Yeah, exactly. And then I think the the course that I sat in on, he gave a much more a much broader sort of um, uh, swath of the history of pragmatism, returning back to those early texts of Peirce and and uh, and James in particular, and then moving from there. I mean, I think that the semester did end up with with the uh, with people like Rarity and Habermas, but um, it really began there. And it was a great course. I mean, I think it set me on a path to to. Uh, do some of my own work in that area, and then you know when I got to Penn State, of course, um, the the tradition of American pragmatism here has uh, just furthered my interest in in that, and particularly Purse. I mean, you and I have talked a lot about uh, Purse's role, and I could hear a lot of Purse in your paper. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I I mean, you obviously don't read the footnotes, but the footnotes are filled with references to Purse. But I mean, this was part of the way in which. Um, his pluralism um, means that um, you follow an issue and the boundaries between American pragmatism, continental, analytic, they don't matter. You go where the issue takes you. And so I think those of us who studied with him have a, um, we have a way of proceeding that, okay, if Peirce is helping me, then I have to go to Peirce. And if Derrida is helping me, then I go to Derrida. And I think sometimes, I don't know if you feel this, but the so-called outside world um, doesn't always quite understand that, um, and they think we engage in these strange combinations. But they're not combinations, they're just, you know, this is what pursuing philosophy as a real pluralist means. You pursue the issue and it doesn't matter who joins the conversation. Yeah, and I mean, I think that really allows him to uh, bring people into conversation with one another that you wouldn't normally expect, uh, and and that seem uh, irreconcilable in certain ways. I mean, if you look at his his um, essays, he's got you know all kinds of people from both sides of the tradition talking to each other, both sides of the continental analytic divide talking to each other, and and bringing their insights to bear on a specific issue, um, and and he's able to really show that there that there there may be different languages, different sort of. Um, mindsets or approaches, but really the underlying issue is the same. Yeah, and I think, I mean, that ties up with a point you made earlier, namely this um, putting the, the text or the argument in the best possible light. He's a very good translator in that sense. That is, uh, not, you know, from French to English or German to English, but in the sense Derrida may have this vocabulary, and I'm not going to get caught up in the terms. I'm and and therefore I could put him in conversation perhaps with someone like Peirce or Habermas or or so on because I'm not going to get caught up in the terms um, and I'm going to translate those in order to facilitate a, a dialogue. Yeah, I mean uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about your paper because I thought you did that you you performed that really well with uh, a, a, you know starting off with with Adorno and going to Dun Scotus and then coming back to issues you know in Adorno and that's not something that uh, that you see often. I mean, well, actually, you're the only one I ever see doing that kind of that kind of thing. Well, I, I mean, I, uh, you're the, I'm the only one maybe who does that vis-a-vis -vis medieval philosophy. I think a lot of us do it in relation to Kant or Hegel or Aristotle or Plato. Um, but I, I mean, for me, the, the issue is um, I, I often characterize myself as a historian of philosophy, but um, 
I, I add to, always to that that I'm not a zookeeper. And I mean by that, I'm not interested in the history of philosophy as like various exhibits like, oh, look how cute they were in the Middle Ages. They thought there were angels. And oh, look, Thales had this stupid idea that everything is from water. Um, I mean, if you're just going to, you know, keep zoo exhibits, then I, I say stop reading the history of philosophy. And so for me, the only reason to keep reading Duns Scotus is if there's something of import and interest there. And, and that can happen in many ways. And for me, what was interesting was I was trying to think through this issue that Adorno raised for me, um, namely, um, how can we hold together the sort of the, the need we have for general and universal concepts while all the while recognizing what he calls the non-identity between the concept and that which is conceived by means of the concept. And I think Duns Scotus still today has things to contribute to this conversation. I think, by the way, Peirce taught us that, if only we listened to what Peirce had to say about it. And so I could add Peirce to that conversation, as well as Deleuze and, and several others. Um, so, I mean, that's my approach was, um, why is this important for Adorno, and is there something we could learn about why it's important for Adorno by putting him in conversation with Don Scotus? Yeah, and I think, I mean, one of the things that is, uh, that is tremendously um, uh, important about the way um, sort of Bernstein taught us to, to read text is that um, that... Uh, there, w there never was a, a zookeeping element to it. There was, there, it was always about um, trying to think your way into the ideas of these historical figures in, in their own context to see both the timelessness of the questions that they were asking and, but also the, the timeliness of the way they were asking the questions and what resources or insights they had that uh, are eclipsed by you know, the conditions under which we're now reading them. So, right. You know, um, with regard to somebody like Aristotle or the Greeks, you know, it, it was always okay. Take, let's let's look at uh, what what thinking was like uh, before Kant, before the modern subject had emerged, and we, you know, all of the things through which we kind of um, read. You know, we necessarily have to read things now because of uh, of the the power of those thinkers, of those modern thinkers. Um, here now we have access to not to not some impoverished thinking in the Greeks, but uh, some rich thinking that actually has insights that we we, we just uh, need to need to learn from now. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think in in a strange way, um, in uh, at least one essay of his that I can think of, and the title escapes me, he sort of challenges uh, Habermas to be more pragmatic than. Kantian. Um, and I think in relation to Gadamer, he often will make claims that, well, Gadamer is a kind of pragmatist. But I think I would challenge him to work that in the other direction, that he's actually made pragmatism more hermeneutic. Um, and I think there are important, there's a, a separate hermeneutic contribution to his thinking that is not just um, it can't be totally unpacked from out of the pragmatic tradition. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think the, the place that I see that um, resonating is in um, Bernstein's account of phronesis in Gadamer. Obviously, that, that notion of phronesis is so important and the application coming out of truth and method in, in Gadamer. And um, Bernstein really, really uh, hones in on that idea in his account of um, uh, of Gadamer's work, and it fits so nicely with Bernstein's earlier earliest engagement with the idea of praxis. And so, praxis is always um, a very I mean, for Bernstein just an extremely rich concept that um, extends from uh, normal actions that we would think of in, in a kind of canonical way um, to readings of text and engagement, you know, uh, dialogue. With, with one another, and I think that's a, a, a really powerful point. In fact, one of the things that I uh, wanted to talk to you about, we didn't get a chance to do this um, over the weekend, was 
you know, his very strong, the, on Saturday, he was, uh, I think he might have been responding to Jonathan Pickle's paper about um, the distinction between praxis and poiesis. And the re he, was, he was adamantly rejecting the uh, ability to hold that distinction uh, strongly that Arendt seemed to uh, articulate in, in her work. Yeah, I think so. And, and I think for him, um, I, if I recall correctly, he, he raised that refusal to make that distinction um, in the direction of um, saying that for him, if you ask the question, can we make the world better through acting, for him the answer has to always be yes. And that somehow for him, that yes is related to the um, instability of the distinction between praxis and poiesis. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that ha had me, well, first of all, so, I mean, that brings up the issue of, of the, what I would call his realistic optimism, although I think some people think of it as, as naive, but I think you want, anyone who's remotely optimistic runs that, <laughs> runs that risk of being naive, but, uh, or being at least uh, uh, identified as naive. But, but the thing that I appreciated about the, the need to um, hold on to the connection between uh, poiesis and praxis between the um, a more instrumental understanding of um, of action and let's say a, a more a liberated conception of action is that uh, if we forget that um, thinking and speaking and acting all of which are wrapped up with one another have instrumental effects and are instrumental also in what in, in, in however that emancipatory they might also be um, we're we're going to lose the real question of power, question of violence, and some of these other issues that are critical for us to hold in mind, even as we try to put our words uh, into practice in ways that are um, empowering and healthy and liberating. Yeah, and I think um, I mean he only gave some indications of this, I think, in that same discussion period, but I began to see that um, part of his critique of um, Arendt um, is he's a little bit while understanding why she's worried about the encroachment of the social in the modern period and in the human condition I, I agree with him I, I think there's tremendous problems with her criticism and rejection of the social but for him this his rejecting that criticism and uh, and her own rejection was part and parcel with this notion, and he said it a couple of times, you cannot talk about action without at the same time talking about the material conditions. And that without looking at the social, um, you'll never understand the material conditions, and therefore you're not talking ever about any kind of action we could actually engage in. And so I think... Um, I think he ended that by saying she needs more marks, um, and um, I, I, I certainly agree with him, but it has something to do with what you were saying, namely operations of power, conditions of power, which I find in her notion of action, I, I mean, I'm almost tempted to call it pure action, um, she always, yes, she talks about the... the um, uh, natality of it, the incipient character of it, um, the um, as Heidegger might say it, the anfanglich um, dimension of it. Sure, but that always because that heavy emphasis on that it's a new beginning, it's creative, it's um, you know it, it's without telos and we don't we can't control it and we we don't know where it's going to go she, I think, loses sight that that takes place within a context. Um, and I think she doesn't give us enough tools to um, critique in the Kantian sense, take apart and analyze and think through just what those conditions are. And I think he was pushing on, on precisely that issue. Yeah, I agree. I think, well, I mean, well, I found myself thinking in that, in the, when I was listening to that conversation that um, there, there's, uh, you know, what, what Arendt gives us with the distinction she makes, she takes away with the same distinctions. I mean, the clarity of private-public distinction, the clarity of, you know, labor work, action, 
the clarity of the, the idea of the social emerging between the public and the private. I mean, they're tremendously powerful precisely because they are distinctions and, and, she, and she tries to hold them rigorously. Um, but of course, you know, you can always show even internally to her own thinking that she can't. And it, it's sort of, I mean, and, and Bernstein always encourages us to do this, you know, it's kind of imminent critique of a thinker, so I've got to understand the distinctions they're making and then watch how they, they don't stick to their own, their own distinctions. Yeah, I, I, you know, I was participating this last summer in the Collegium Phenomenologicum, and I was there the second week when Andrew Benjamin was lecturing, and part of his discussion was about uh, the issue of action in the human condition. And I don't remember who, but one of the participants in my seminar when we were reading that text was pointing to this very kind of instability of these very powerful distinctions by pointing out that she needs something like, for example, forgiveness in order, as it were, to mop up the problems that her notion of action um, uh, brings to the fore. And if she had a slightly different notion of action, she wouldn't need a notion of forgiveness. So it's because this notion of action is unbearable that we need a, a notion of forgiveness. Yeah, no, I, I mean, that makes some sense. But I think what's, what's interesting when you, when you think about, I mean, obviously uh, Bernstein was tremendously influenced by his relationship with Hannah Arendt. He uh, says in stories all the time that he really came to the New School because she, uh, when she died or before she died, she really um, asked him to, to consider it and, and to take care of, of, the, of, of the spirit of the philosophy department at the New School, which, I mean, boy, he really lived up to that, <laughs> to that task. But, but, I mean, they, they definitely had a, a very um, uh, intense kind of philosophical relationship, but they uh, disagreed, you know, almost uh, uh, entirely in a lot of these particularly specific kinds of issues. And it seems to me that Bernstein's, you know, unwillingness to uh, engage in dichotomies and in, in, in dichotomous thinking, um, and his, his, you know, I mean, I think that's his Dewey and you know, uh, uh, streak. Uh, deep Dewey and streak in him is to say, whenever he sees a dichotomy, his his impulse is to say, well, it was originally together, <laughs> and you know, why are you trying to bring things? You know, you're creating this problem that you know we have to bring these things. Right. Together. Um, and that came up for a moment uh, this weekend, and and I think you're right. His his impulse is to say, you're looking for a third thing to bring these two together, but you don't need that third thing because they're actually not a part. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I mean, you know, you saw it with obviously Hegel is another really important figure for him, and and uh, Karen Eng's paper on, on Hegel was 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 really good, bringing kind of uh, looking at a looking at Hegel from a kind of feminist perspective. And it's just you know he's been doing it for however many years, you know, he's setting this kind of people have a certain kind of critique of Hegel as an absolutist thinker and and all of that, and he just gets. He gets going, that's not Hegel. Right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> He's never convinced me of that, but that is his that is his argument. Exactly, exactly. Um, well, one of the things that uh, that uh, you and I talked a little bit about and that emerged emerged early in the in the discussion in the in the weekend was um, the question of proximity and distance. The, the, the and this emerged really, I think, a little bit out of. Uh, Megan Craig's paper, uh, who, who, where she really talked, uh, she used some really good, powerful examples of cyberbullying and uh, and compared, made a comparison uh, with um, the kind of military use of drones to uh, in a in, in a in a very virtual way. Somebody presses a button, and, and in a very real way, um, missiles are launched that have deadly force. Uh, comparing that also to bullying, where I think she had this really great formulation where you know the, the violence of bullying is that the bully um, uh, destroys the victim from the inside, is able to really pick, you know, get at the the, the deepest insecurities. Um, and she she uh, Megan Craig really uh, did a nice job of say of, of showing some of the limitations of of the always on social media world that a lot of young people live in. 
um, that doesn't give you a lot of distance for reflection, for you know, even the question of sort of safe space that allows you to sort of gain a, a perspective and purchase on what you're experiencing. Um, and, and, and I think that was a theme that emerged early on. Yeah, but also I, I've been thinking a lot about it, and especially in relation to your paper on ethics in a digital age, and and you know you're holding out the possibility that maybe um, a, a kind of, as you just put it, cyberspace is what Arendt would call a space of appearances, in in which I can emerge and and be recognized as a political actor. Um, and um, so thinking about that in relation to uh, Megan's paper, the, the interesting thing about cyberspace is that one, at one and the same time, it's both too close and too far. Um, that is, the sort of always on um, means that, you know, well, for example, no matter where I am in my house or outside, I got your tweet today that, you know, should we have this conversation? Um, and so, I mean, that's really close. And when it's good, we're all fine with that. Um, I mean, you and I often talk about how our our really strong friendship began, in fact, over email. And um, so there is that proximity. But then the question is, does the distance and and maybe even also the lack of embodiment, material embodiment, that also uh, allow for a certain callousness, a certain um, lack of um, the kind of messiness that our actions have in the world when we're standing next to each other, that we don't see that messiness. We don't feel in, in a real sense. Um, we don't feel that messiness. And so I like the, the playing with the ideas of proximity and distance, but I think when it comes to um, the web and and various digital media, it's an interesting combination of both proximity and distance. Yeah, no, I think I think that's exactly right. I mean, my in my argument in my paper was really to try to see if I could take uh, Bernstein's engaged fallibilistic pluralism and integrate it into a kind of um, ethics of philosophy in a digital age where the the, the virtues of uh, a certain kind of engagement, commitment to, to pluralism, and uh, I think in a way, most importantly, a recognition of our own fallibility, uh, which it, from my perspective, and I think drawing deeply on Bernstein, is sort of coming to terms with our own finitude and, uh, and, and recognizing that, you know, you know, we have commitments and we need to advocate for those commitments, but that, but that we also always need to be prepared that those commitments are conditioned by a, a finitude and a fallibility that we that we can't escape, um, and I, I think those those values, uh, which are also I think virtues when practiced effectively, um, are tremendously powerful. But the issue is, you know, this medium, uh, these technologies, and I, I use the plural there intentionally because they're different technologies are doing different things. You know, obviously Google Hangout, we're having a conversation that has some dimensions of the face to face, although, you know, we our pheromones aren't, you know, interacting with one another, but you know, I can at least see facial facial, you know, gestures and things, which is different from text, which is different from Twitter or Facebook or Google Plus or so I mean there's a there definitely is a tendency for people to talk about technology in the abstract and not to get into the affordances and limitations of, of each of the specific technologies. And I think it's really only by uh, using them, by, by putting them into practice, that we figure out what they can do to, for us and what they're doing to us. Um, but, I mean, that, that's something we can't just sort of think in the abstract about. We have to, we have to engage in that uh, directly. Well, and I know both you and I are... Um were followers or fans or however you want to put it of Leo Laporte and um, Twit and he just he has a podcast called Triangulation and the most recent one he did with Robert Scoble um, and Scoble was trying to convince him that if only he curates Facebook correctly um, he would he'll understand the power of it and the usefulness of it and so for about an hour he went through you know, and all these settings, you know, you have to put friends into either close friends or acquaintances and, you know, so on. And um, and 
one of the reasons I stopped using Facebook was precisely because it wasn't useful. Um, but that's not a critique of technology. That's a kind of imminent critique of what this what this medium is capable of and where its failures are. Uh, Adorno would say, what is its promise and where does it fail to live up on its promise? And I mean, so I spent a couple of hours going through and doing what Scoble said, and I got to tell you, I still don't like Facebook. <laughs> well, you know, I think Leo the Port also, because I, I, I have triangulation on the docket. I'm, I'm going to uh, listen to that. Did you watch? Is it a video too, or did you watch? Yeah, it, it is a video, and I think it's more important to watch it. I listened yeah. to it. Yeah, um, I, I, I was holding back because I thought I might need to watch it rather than listen to it. But but even I mean, I, I'm listening now to. Uh, the, uh, the current episode of uh, This Week in Technology, Twit, and uh, he, I mean, Leo says, yeah, I, I've deleted Facebook now from, from my phone, you know, right. even after the school experience. So, I mean, I think it's, it's exactly right. The, um, uh, you know, I, I put, I've put work into Twitter, for example, in terms of making lists and things, and because I, I've, I've gotten a lot of use out of being able to see what's happening locally, what, what's going on in, let's say, digital humanities, or I've got a group, a list of philosophers, I've got a list of people I don't want to miss that you're on, and, and other people who I just want to make sure I, I catch everything that they're doing. Um, so I use it, you know, that way, and it's tremendously powerful for me, but it did take time to set, it does take time to set up, to nurture, to curate. Right. And it's not always intuitively obvious for people who aren't, they just want it to work. Um, and, uh, you know, you and I were all, some of the early adopters of computers and technology and with WordPerfect and revealing codes and doing <laughs> mail merges and so on. That's right. Yeah, you're never gonna live, let me live that down. You, you introduced me to Word and I was like, well, where, where, are, the, where are the reveal co codes? <laughs> Yeah, and we were doing email over Pine on Unix servers, and um, so people who don't have that kind of patience, they they will get overwhelmed, I think, by these tools. Um, and and um, so I I think that's true, but I think also, I mean, the one question for me is: is that new? Is that a twentieth, twenty-first century newness, or? Has this overwhelming always been the case? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, well, uh, that, um, you know, a, a couple things. One thing uh, with regard to the newness question, I mean, I, that's something that you and I have been talking a lot about, and I'm hoping that we'll, we'll be able to, uh, we've written two articles together, and hopefully we'll be able to write a third now on this sort of issue of technologies of writing and seeing if we could trace that. Uh, what's different about this, uh, this, um, iteration of a technological advance versus uh, earlier ones and, and where the continuity lies. I think a lot of work needs to be done in terms of uh, fleshing out a, a nuanced uh, vision of that. I mean, it's easy to say, well, this is like the Gutenberg printing press. This is like the emergence of writing in ancient Greek um, a world. But it's uh, another thing to kind of try and catch that out in, in, in some detail. So hopefully we'll be able to do that um, together, but I think that the, one of the things that I've been um, thinking a lot about is that, you know, there's, there, there really is um, a, hes a resistance for, I'd say, professional philosophers in general. I don't want to generalize too much, but, you know, people are starting to come around a little bit, but there's a tremendous um, tendency to sort of fetishize the face-to-face -face and to fetishize a, a proximity in a specific kind of way and without wanting to denigrate that I mean obviously that's an important part of our lives and I wouldn't want to ever lose that I mean I, I get so much out of going to conferences seeing you at conferences and 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 seeing others who I've been following along on uh, social media at, at conferences uh, and our relationships are enriched by the fact that we've had this ongoing conversation in between the times we actually are together but I think we need to you know, think a, a, a lot about you know, um, it's not an either-or question. It's not, you know, if you're, if you're using some of these technologies, it's not like you don't care anymore about, you know, face-to-face -face conversations. Right, and I, I think that, um, I, I think that we've forgotten that um, our relationships were never exclusively about face-to-face -face 
um, uh, meetings. Um, I mean, we we've had relationships th throughout history with people who were distant sometimes and near other times, and um, and that you know I never confuse the fact that you tweet to me or tweet to a public and I receive it as you know sitting down as we did the other night in a bar having a drink. Um, right. and well and then one of the things that I think really important from my perspective is, and it's an ongoing conversation you and I have had is you know I really appreciated the, the checking in with you about okay well how am I appearing in, right. these, in these in public this way. I mean you know you're it's very difficult I think to see exactly what it looks like, what your online presence looks like uh, from someone else's perspective. I think th those conversations are really important. Yeah, and I, I mean, one, uh, you, you've done a lot of thinking about this and writing about it, but I, I have a friend, he was actually a former, well, I won't go, I, I don't want to name names, um, but um, on Twitter, um, he was appearing as quite a jerk, um, and he had only one Twitter account and so this had implications on his professional life um, invitations to conferences or to speak and so on and um, so I finally convinced him and also he was allowing students to to follow him um, I mean wow I, I guess you can't really allow that um, you can shut off your account, but um, and I convinced him. You know what? If it's fine if you want to talk like that with your friends, I mean, you and I could sit down and talk smack about some philosopher or something. Right. But he was not aware of he was actually. And here is where I think you're right. He was appearing in public, and he was appearing in public as a jerk. <laughs> And uh, his solution was, uh, because that was part of his personality, was to create a professional Twitter account and his, you know, friendly t Twitter account. Well, I mean, I think one of the things I've been thinking a lot about it here at Penn State and in my role as Associate Dean for Graduate Education and, and in, the, in the department, too, although I want, I'm thinking broader than just philosophy, is, you know, we really need to help our graduate students uh, think about, you know, where they how they can use these powerful publishing platforms um, to cre to create and cultivate a, a professional presence that will open doors up for them rather than shut them down. I mean, um, you know, just getting students to um, begin to talk a, in out loud about their research process or about uh, the kind of work that they're doing, beginning to get them to tweet out or curate links associated with some of the issues that they're find that they find of interest, you know, just doing some of those basic things can really um, help them establish a presence that, that can be uh, really important for them in their future career. Yeah, and also expand their, their web of, of people who are working in similar fields and um, can generate, you know, new issues, new excitement, and so on. No, I, I, I think that's all true, and, and I think again, um, your your issue of um, uh, affordances and limitations is really important to to think about. I mean, there 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 is no reason to to well. First of all, the blanket critique of technology, I think, is is metaphysical. I think, um, and it, I think it's. As much as you want to tell me, Heidegger uses the term essence, Weizen, in, in, a, in a, a critical, and he sort of reorients it. Um, to say that there is an essence of technology, and on the basis of which we can critique all technology, I think is the old gesture of metaphysics. And as Reiner Schroemann would say, that's a very old and very boring story. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I think you're right. And I think also, I mean, there are other philosophers one could go to. So, I mean, I'm not an expert, but a kind of Deleuzian model of a kind of flows and networks of power and, and power and nodes and so on is more in line with your issue of affordances and limitations, um, uh, force and resistance than, I think, um, other models. And so... I, I think that there are philosophers out there who would give us uh, a lot of models um, for 
engaging in a critique, not a criticism and rejection, but an actual critique of all sorts of media, of all sorts of technologies. Um, and I, I think that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think one of the things that we, um, that, that came up in relationship to uh, uh, my talk too was the, the, the questions of, uh, of, of the material conditions of, of the communication platforms that we're dealing with. So things like Google and, and Facebook and Twitter and the global economic uh, forces that are at work in, in, you know, and embedded in those uh, modes of, uh, of communication. I mean, that, that's something that, uh, that I didn't address explicitly in, in my paper, but it's something that, uh, you know, really uh, needs to be thought about in, in um, you know, nuanced ways because, uh, you know, we, well, you and I have talked about, you know, feeding Google <laughs> all of our information so we could get, you know, better Google now. Uh, and now I feel like I'm channeling like uh, Jeff Jarvis from This Week in Google or something. But uh, but and, and there's a real value in that. But I think one of the things that they don't talk about in, the, in This Week in Google uh, at all, really, it, it, which is uh, a podcast about the cloud, is uh, well, they do come to they do talk about it, but they don't have a critical stance toward the 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 global capitalistic forces that are at work on them. That in fact we are the product of this. Yes, we do get a lot of value out of it, and I, I'm certainly not sticking my head in the sand and saying I'm not going to use this stuff. I'm using it. But we need a whole lot more information about the algorithms that are at work here, uh, and, and, and we need ourselves to learn more about, to become more algorithmically literate in, in terms of thinking about how these, um, these technologies are, are working on it, how they're monetizing us, how they're... Um, how, how they're their affordances and limitations are really driven by a market. Yeah, and I think you know the the more you learn about um, uh, various programming languages, various uh, programming styles, and um, algorithms in general. Um, I mean, we're not yet at the point where. Um, there are binary decisions. You either go this way or you go that way, and we can't yet deal so well with a, a kind of... You, you can't write a program that deals very well with messiness, and so these platforms um, are sort of... Um, they, they make certain things possible by also denying the possibility of other things, and when we float on the beautiful graphical user interface that's on the top, all of those decisions are hidden for us. Um, and we don't know what we don't, in fact, we don't know what decisions have been made um, for us and not. And, you know, I think now, just a very simple example, the, the rumors are out that the next Windows, whatever it's going to be called, Windows 9 or whatever, is going to have the possibility of multiple virtual desktops. Well, Mac OS X has had that for I don't know how long. Linux has had it almost since the beginning. Um, but there's an example of a decision has been made. And that decision affects your workflow. So, for example, I, I have a dual monitor setup right now. And when I'm replying to an email on one screen, I can have a, a, a calendar open on the other. I can have four desktops and switch back and forth between them, and that I find is a helpful way to to organize my work. It might not be for everyone, but the point is, Windows had made that choice. It's not for you, or you're not going to have access to it. And so those kinds of decisions are being made all the time, and I think we need to know what decisions have been made and what decisions haven't been made, which is why I'm an advocate for free software, because all of that then is available in the open. Yeah, absolutely, and, and you know, the, and the need to be uh, transparent about it. I think um, one, of, one of the things that, uh, in, particularly regarding this issue of decisions that are made on the technical level that you don't really realize, uh, I think I mentioned to you this weekend this uh, book, You Are Not a Gadget by uh, Jaron Lanier, and, and he, he makes the point there in, in that book that, um, uh, that, in fact, you know, the decision to use the MP3 
as the as the as the standard for music files it really was uh, a privileging of an atomistic note mode you know a piano kind of mode of, of musicality which takes uh, notes in their atomic individuality um, something that resonated with me as a as as, as somebody who uh, loves to take issue with the modern critique of atomic individualism uh, and and or not take issue with that critique but actually level that critique um, but that's a that's a technical decision that was made about the mp3 player and file format that uh, has had tremendous impact on the quality of music the different kinds of the, the possibility of music files uh, that I'm sure did not occur to people at the time as a decisive decision. Right, yeah, and so then the question is how many of these are being made all the time in the platforms we use, you know, every single day? Well, right, not only that, how, how uh, what about more pernicious kinds of decisions? What about um, issues of, of gender and issues of other issues of diversity and power that get coded into the programs themselves? Right. Uh, you know, the forcing of someone to choose between male and female on questionnaires. These kinds of issues are, you know, things that, well, the database needs to have this. It needs, it needs a decision. Obviously, you can create more. Um, you could put a scale on it. I mean, but, but, you know, those, you can't pretend that those issues are not uh, at the level of code. And so we also need to be thinking about you know, what is happening at the level of code. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Facebook had that early on where they, for gender, they had only male or female. Um, and, you know, while for relationship they had, you know, married, single, whatever, it's complicated. Um, there was no, it's complicated for the question of gender. Um, it's the same issue with regard to uh, the, the question of forcing people to use their real name, their actual name in, in, on their profiles. I mean, there's a whole set of really interesting and important issues that um, I think those of us with training in the history of philosophy, with training in philosophy more generally, um, have uh, some, some insights or should have some insights uh, in, those, in those questions and, and should, should help um, bring them to bear on some of these issues. But we should do that in a in a way that's as prepared to listen and learn as it is to sort of uh, uh, teach and advocate. Because I think one of the issues that I was trying to articulate in, in my paper was, with from the perspective of, of fallibility, is you know we, we can't as as people trained in philosophy come into these conversations and sort of in, in the same mode of a sage on the stage and a teaching method or something, you know. Right, but but also to come back to something you said earlier. Um, I think the the criticisms of various uh, web uh, technologies and other um, electronic technologies, the criticism fails to remember that those decisions also are often implicitly made in meat space. Um, so, I mean, just to think, uh, we have men's and women's bathrooms, right? And so it's not like in meat space everything could be wonderfully ambiguous and we, you know we live in the the world of of wonder of beautiful ambiguity. Um, there are social structures, political structures that inform that have already made decisions for us um, in exactly the same way. And there are digital technologies that can also be liberating from those very decisions that are made in meat space. To look at the issue of scholarship for a moment, I mean, I've long been um, really fascinated by the production of critical editions. And so when I look at a critical edition, and I mean, most of the things you can see behind me are critical editions of Occam's works, um, those editors made decisions. And I don't have access to the data uh, uh, that they used in order to make their decisions. I mean, there's a critical apparatus, um, sure, but we have technology now to put all of those manuscripts online. And that, in fact, you don't have to make a decision. You could curate all of them um, and let, let the reader make the decisions. Um, and so... Um, it, it goes both ways in the sense that meat space has its own decisiveness, its own problems with ambiguity, and we should analyze and critique and understand those. 
And also on the other side, digital technologies sometimes have um, liberatory potentials. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I mean, I think just the, the, the range of this conversation we've had is a, is a good testimony to uh, the kind of, the spirit of uh, Bernstein's teaching and his thinking because uh, we really, we range from specific philosophers to the history of technology and I, I definitely, you know, Bernstein always joked around about the fact that, you know, uh, I helped him out with his computers at a time when uh, computers were just, uh, just getting started, and he, he certainly uh, has always been very concerned about issues of globalization and, and other things. But it, but in a way, I think the the transformative uh, technology of the World Wide Web and the, um, the 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 affordances and limitations that bring with them that that's that that came very late in his life, and he hasn't you know focused his own attention. Uh, uh, on that, uh, partly because I think you know, in order to do it in a in an effective way, you have to you have to use the the technologies to to figure them out. Yeah, well, and also part of our finitude is we have our own affordances and limitations, and we can't take on everything. That's exactly right, and I think uh, it was really wonderful to have the time that, with him this weekend. I mean, uh, I was transported transported back into the graduate. Uh, Graduate faculty building in the new school, and uh, with I mean, his his mind is is sharp, and he is really, um, you know, just continuing to teach. I mean, just the things I learned from him this weekend are a testimony to that. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. Great. Well, thank you for uh, joining the Digital Dialogue. Thank you for having me. This has been the Digital Dialogue.